Good morning, everyone. On this um, Thursday morning, we give thanks to God for all the ways that we are blessed by his presence and his word, his healing, his salvation, his grace. And we gather in that word in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. In the name, I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you'd keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings and life may please you. For into your hand I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, O God that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Praise to the blessed and holy Trinity, one God who gives us life, salvation, and resurrection. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Give glory to God, our light and our life. O come, let us worship and praise. Be still and know that I am God. Today in our Limping with God, we are... Um, we just had those two sisters who built the house of Israel, and today we are having the fruitful winter. Thus the man increased greatly and had large flocks, female servants and male servants and camels and donkeys. Genesis 30, 43. Don't we all wish we had more camels and donkeys? I mean, just it's on the wish list for everybody, um, is what Chad Bird has to say. Over the years, I have had countless conversations with brothers and sisters in Christ that follow the same basic pattern. I went through a very dark and difficult time in my life. It hurt. It was stressful. At times, it felt like I was living through a nightmare from which I could not awaken. When it was finally over and come time, some time had passed, I realized in retrospect that it was during that season of tears and tribulation that the Lord was laboring most intensely in my life. On the one hand, yes, it was the worst of times. On the other hand, it was the best of times for Christ to shape and bless and move me down the path I wanted. he wanted me to go. We might call this a spiritual season the fruitful winter. The fruitful winter is nothing new in the lives of people of God. Paul gives classic expression to it in his writings, especially in 2 Corinthians, multiple times. What Jesus said to Paul epitomizes the truth. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. The Greek verb for make perfect, tello, is the same verb used by Jesus on the cross when he cried, tetele late stay which that is it is finished or it has been made perfect and the greek noun that paul uses for weakness is the same word paul will use in the next chapter when he says that christ was crucified in weakness we might summarize it this way as the crucifixion death of jesus in weakness made perfect our salvation so our own weaknesses trials and crosses are when the gracious power of God does its perfect work within us. Or as Paul ironically phrases it, when I am weak, then I am strong. So Genesis 30, we are in the middle of Jacob's fruitful winter. Um, his um, uncle Laban is the thorn in his flesh, just like Pharaoh was a Pharaoh-like character in the, in the book. Laban is one that when we first meet him in the Bible in Genesis 24, it's when Abraham is um, in Haran and um, looking for a wife for Isaac. And Laban runs out to meet, meet the servant as soon as he saw the ring and bracelet on his sister's arms. So he was a man that liked things that glittered. Um, and so we see him now as um, at this late point in Laban's life, he's not much changed. He's more wrinkled, and his greediness does not seem to have lost its youthful vigor. Here, here's how we know: having served Laban for fourteen years, seven for Leah and seven more for Rachel, Jacob is itching to get back home, so he asks permission to leave. His father-in-law, however, is in no hurry to lose Jacob. He knows good and well that the Lord has blessed him with healthy and rapid growing flocks. 
cha-ching, primarily because of Jacob. So in Laban's mind, his son-in-law has become a cash cow. So the two of them haggle for a while and decide on who, they, you know, every speckled or spotted lamb will go to one and the other one's the other way. And Jacob continues to care for Laban's livestock. And then every newborn, newly born, non-monochromatic animal will be his. Well, statistically, and the kind of goats these were, they would have all been going to Laban. It was not a fair deal. He was trying to swindle him. And from very, um, it seems like Laban has sta stabbed Jacob in the back again. And yet... Yet God comes to Jacob in a dream and tells him how to, uh, some breeding techniques of waving wands and things like that, that um, might sound kind of silly, but it works. As, as After six years, his um, Jacob's pro, um, goat flock had increased so greatly, and the female and male servants and the donkeys and camels, that... Um, Laban's sons begin to grumble. Jacob has taken all that was our father's, and from what was our father's, he has gained all his wealth. So basically, um, God has made it so that Jacob is flourishing, and Laban and his family are not. What the Lord did for Jacob is a key theme in the Old Testament. The storyline goes like this. One, God's people are in exile. Two, they are oppressed. Three, God enriches them at the expense of their oppressors. Four, they, live, they can leave exile with more than they entered. When we see this with Abram and Sarah during their stay in Egypt and here with Jacob and soon, who will soon depart for home. And we also observe it again with the Israelites leave Egypt that they cut with the country's riches in tow. In other words, this is the theme of the fruitful winter when J Yahweh's power is made perfect in their weakness. I doubt there is, is a more difficult truth for us the disciples of Jesus, to swallow than this one. I readily confess that I loathe being weak when the Labans in my life take advantage of me, cheat me, lie to me, to me and about me. My first instinct is to crave revenge. My desire is to be in complete control of my life, a step ahead of my competition, have all my ducks in the rows, and to be healthy and strong enough to push my agenda forward and to a successful completion. In other words, I want my will to be done and my and done in my way at the time of my choosing and according to my precise specifications. And it is not too much to ask. I'd like a little applause along the way. In short, I like fruitful summers, not fruitful winters, don't we all? But what we like and what our Father knows is best for us are rarely in alignment. The end result of our will always being done would be our undoing, our destruction, both in this life and the eternity. We are like three or four-year-old children whose wills are bent toward those things that satisfy momentarily and disappoint permanently. So our Lord and Father, whose will is to save and bless and refine us, leads us into a wintry exile where we learn, usually the hard way, that he is God and we are not. In this wintry exile, however, we are not just learning morality and weakness and vulnerability, but much more importantly, our Savior's mercy and grace towards us. As the apostle says, when I am weak, I am strong. Our weakness opens up a vacuum within us to be filled with the strength of Jesus. We are enrolled in the school of the cross, which by definition is going to hurt, but it also simultaneously going to show forth the glory of God in our lives. In Jacob's case, without Laban, without exile, without bearing his own cross, the patriarch would never have gained a family and possessions with which to return from exile. God's power was made perfect in Jacob's weakness. We see, therefore, that for the disciples of Jesus, the cross will always define us, how the, for us how the Lord is at work in our lives. This doesn't mean that we aren't we are always hurting, always overshadowed by the dooms and glooms of life. Rather, it means that discipleship is dying to self, dying to self-will, dying to what we want, so that our co-crucifixion with Jesus through that. We die with him in order to be raised with him in new life. As Paul says, do you not know that all of us have who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, 
in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For our new life is shaped by baptism, in which we both die and rise with Jesus. This once-in-a-lifetime union with him in the word-soaked water of baptism is a pattern for our entire lives. As daily as as daily the Spirit puts to death our rebellious and egocentric natures and rises us to reflect the image of our Lord and King. In our fruitful winter, the Messiah does not abandon us. Quite the opposite. With his own hands and side still bearing the marks and the spears and nails, those stigmata of divine love, he gently shepherds us into our own weakness and his ongoing and merciful strength. I wish this wasn't true. <laughs> I wish this wasn't the case, that fruitful winters exist. Sometimes, I mean, or if fruitful winters happen, it's fruitfulness because of a fallow time of rest, not a time of tribulation and challenge where we cannot plant a thing, where we cannot um, reap anything, where we cannot do anything. Um, but there's truth, isn't there, in this, that there are times in life where we seem to grow the most, our faith is deepened the most, um, we come out with a peace that is um, surpasses all understanding, um, and usually it's on the other side of an exile um, of some sort, either a needing to move because of a situation, a um, a death, um, a long illness, a loss of a job. Um, all those things can happen in our lives. Um, and they do. And there is a, there's a time of winter, um, winter of, um, and the kind of winter, not necessarily like the kind of winter here, maybe, even though we complain about it sometimes when it happens here, but the winter maybe of a flooding, and or of deep, deep cold, bitter, that nothing can be harvested, nothing can be planted, um, that we are simply at the mercy of the season ending and us getting to the other side because all we're doing is holding on by our fingernails. Um, in those seasons, God is at work in you. God is working through the waiting for the radiation to work, waiting for the chemotherapy to attack those cells he is that that which attacks your cancer he is that which is in the healing moments of not being able to lift more than a, a gallon of milk or less um, when you're needing to be helped when you're needing to be bathed when you're needing to be driven to the doctor when you when you are um, searching for work when your heart is broken open by a death or a loss of relationship God is working in those moments, bringing you mercy and life and, and yes, strength at the end. He is your strength through it. And then at the other end, what you get is not more strength necessarily, but greater dependence and understanding that God is going to get you through those hard moments. God is the way and the truth and the life through those moments. Um, so it's not that we become stronger or that our character improves perhaps, um, but that God has molded us in those times into um, those that receive the, through a death and resurrection, new life. And once molded, the mold is easy to go back into in those other times that will come um, and that we'll rely on it. We'll understand it. We will see it coming and know that even though right now is impossible, that God will see us through. And yes, sometimes things feel completely like that will not be the case. But even if it ends in death, God then brings eternal life to us. So the truth of the matter is in all matters of winter, God is King and Lord in your life being your comfort, being your strength, being the one who sees you through it. You yourself are not producing very much, but the Lord is producing of an abundance in you, through you, for your sake and for the sake of others. Thanks be to God. This is most certainly true, as we say. Um, amen, amen, alleluia, that God is the one who is our strength in times of trouble.
Be still and know that I am God. You have been born anew through the living and abiding word of God. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. Mighty God of mercy, we thank you for the resurrection dawn, bringing the glory of our risen Lord who makes every day new. Especially we thank you for the sustaining goodness of your creation. We give thanks that you are in our winters, Lord, that you sustain us and provide for us, that you act on our behalf, that you um, create an abundance in seasons of fallowness, of despair, of, of worry, of sickness, of loneliness, that you are there working. Um, keep that word in our ears that we might know that we are not alone in these times, Lord that you are in fact with us, bringing your resurrection and bringing it to each of us in our moments of need. For the new creation in Christ and all gifts of healing and forgiveness, we pray. We pray for those in moments of winter, um, whatever, however deep the winter might be at this time, for those um, recovering from surgery, from those who are hospitalized, from those who are in the midst of radiation or chemotherapy, for those who are um, receiving mental health care, for those who are um, healing in um, on the cellular le level and the bone level, um, all the different ways we ask that you, you heal and you bring your strength and your abundance um, of, of healing and also of forgiveness placing our trust in you. We pray for the gift of relationships with others, to be able to uphold each other in prayer and remind each other of your gospel. Continue to put those words in our mouth, Lord, and in therefore into the ears of other people. For the communion of faith in your church, Lord, we give thanks for how you knit us together and you support us. Help us to continue to grow in this way, um, caring for one another, inviting people in to new roles and ways of being and to be a place um, and a people for which um, there is space for others and also that we might be known. Merciful God of might, renew this weary world, heal the hurts of all your children and bring about your peace for all in Christ Jesus, the living Lord. Especially we pray for those who govern nations of the world we pray for President Biden and Vice President Harris. We pray for um, all, of, all of the branches of our government. We pray for our local um, government here as well in Washington, wherever you're listening. And we pray for our local leaders. We pray for our, our world leaders of Israel and Palestine and Ukraine and Russia, Miramar and other places um, where leadership is sorely needed um, and weariness can can overwhelm. For people in countries ravaged by strife or warfare, we also pray for your daily bread and for peace to prevail in their hearts. And for all who work for that peace and international harmony, continue to make that work multiply and, and come into our moments and needs of peace as well. For all who strive to save the earth from carelessness and destruction, oh, help us, Lord, in this important work. And for the Church of Jesus Christ in every land, continue to sustain and support us, um, care for us, and um, help us to um, flourish and to continue to proclaim your gospel. Almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us in your mighty power that we may not fall into sin nor be overcome in adversity. And all we do, direct, fulfill us, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless and preserve us this day. Amen.